Welcome to this series of presentations on some of the methodological considerations uh, researchers should keep in mind when they're doing biosocial research. My name is Tarani Chandola. I'm from the University of Manchester and part of the National Centre for Research Methods. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Understanding Society biomarker team who, considered, who contributed a lot of the material and slides to this set of presentations. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge that the methodological considerations we should be keeping in mind when we're doing biosocial research is it's not special, it's nothing new. Uh, it's just that uh, it's just the same sort of issues that should be kept in mind when we're doing uh, standard biological or social science research. It's just that some of these methodological issues get really highlighted and emphasized in particular because of the nature of biosocial data. And I'll be going through some of the examples in which these issues really get emphasized. So this series of talks is divided into three components. First of all, I'll be talking about the need for a biosocial research framework. Secondly, I'll be going into some of the data quality uh, considerations uh, researchers should keep in mind when they're doing biosocial research. And finally, I'll be talking about some of the missing data implications in biosocial research. So uh, the very first part is about why we need to have a biosocial research framework. And uh, for those of you who are completely new to the area and want to know what is biosocial research, I can recommend a really excellent talk by Professor Mikhaila Benzival on the topic, what is biosocial research? And I've got the, the YouTube link over here, and this is part of a series of talks that she has done on biosocial research. And this is uh, a talk that she did for the NCRM. Why do researchers want to combine biological and social data? And that's perhaps the, the most important question in determining the kind of research framework that we have in approaching biosocial research. Um, there are a number of reasons why people are interested in combining biological and social data. For example, people might be interested in using biomarkers as an objective measure of physical functioning, of health and illness. They might be interested in using biomarkers to look at the pathways between social factors and health or they might be interested in using biomarkers to understand how biological factors uh, act as distal causes to influence social outcomes. And you know, in, in line with that, biomarkers can also be used to understand gene and environment interactions. And I'll be going through some example slides of how each of these uh, biological, biosocial frameworks can help in understanding the associations between biological and social data. So, Biomarkers have often been used as a sort of a better, more objective uh, measure of, of, of health. And that's because self-reported health that is collected in standard surveys uh, often has a lot of bias. Uh, it depends on people's own perceptions of their health, so it's, it's very subjective. It depends on people being aware that they have particular disease or illness conditions. So you can imagine that uh, a self-report of health might be considerably affected by all of these biases, uh, by a person's mood on the day that they were sampled. Whereas uh, the, the biomarker, uh, which is you know, based on a clinical objective measure, um, may seem to be free from such biases. But actually there are advantages and disadvantages for using biomarkers in place of self-aided health. And I'll go through a few examples of that. Um, in the labor force survey, for example, uh, they measure stress or work-related stress, and that's, that's my own field of research. And they, they measure stress uh, by asking people, have you suffered from any illness or disability, physical or mental problem that was caused or made worse by your job? Uh, and if people say yes to that, they then get a list of conditions that they ask, you know, how would you describe this illness? And one of those sets of, 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 of descriptions is uh, stress, depression or anxiety. So if people say that they, uh, their, their work, that the health was made worse by work because of stress, depression or anxiety, that's uh, an indication that they have uh, got uh, stress or work-related stress. Um, now you can imagine that there are quite a few uh, biases associated th with this measure. You know, individuals are asked to self-report any work-related illness they, they believe to have suffered over the, over the previous 12 months. So it really depends on their ability and willingness to self-diagnose these, uh, these links. Um, and they, they have to be, in a sense, epidemiologists or medical doctors because they have to ascribe the cause of the illness to work and maybe 
there is a link, maybe there isn't a link. And people may, not, may actually fail to recognize a link with the working conditions when there is one. So there are all kinds of reasons why um, you know, self-reported data on stress or work-related stress might be hard to measure from a, from a questionnaire or interview. Um, so in contrast, we, a lot of people like using uh, biomarkers of stress. So uh, there, there are well-known physiological systems where, which produce stress hormones, uh, which activate the, the, the body stress symptoms. And this, uh, this, gets, you know, th this gets a number of hormones such as cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline going in, in your system. And, and this has been measured in, in quite a few bio, biosocial studies. Um, and it's also important to remember it's not just the activation of these stress hormones uh, during a, an, a, an acute stress response period that is important, but it's the recovery. So this is some of the disadvantages of, 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 of measuring um, biological data as opposed to self-reported data because you've got to be measuring these uh, stress reactions, this physiological stress reaction over a, a considerable period of time, um, you know, and it's, it's, it, it, costs, uh, it, it, it costs a lot of money to not only measure uh, the, these, these stress response systems, these biological stress response systems, but also if you're, if you're thinking about measuring over a long period of time, time, then it, that adds considerably to the, considerably to the cost. So um, you can imagine asking people uh, a question in a questionnaire might be uh, a lot less costly than, than trying to measure their biological stress responses. Biomarkers have also been used to measure uh, how, how people uh, grow and develop and change over the life course. And there are, there are a number of biomarkers that are uh, useful for, for measuring the, these sort of life course develop, developmental processes. Uh, growth hormone, for example. High levels of growth hormone or testosterone in, in early life might be indicative of one kind of process that may, may mean something very different when you have got high levels of the same hormones in later life. So it's important to keep in mind the, the life course processes, uh, that the stages of the life course when these uh, particular biomarkers are, are measured because they have different implications and different meanings. Uh, the gene environment interactions are, are, are shown, some of the possible gene environment interactions are shown in this slide. The G denotes genetic factors, the P denotes uh, uh, phenotypes, uh, sometimes these are uh, biological phenotypes, sometimes these are psychological or personality phenotypes. The E denotes environment, and in, 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 in gene environment analysis, a lot of the times the environment is the social environment. And the Y denotes a sort of distal outcome, usually it's health, but it can be a, another kind of outcome people are interested in. So in the top uh, right hand corner we've got a, a, a causal process that shows that the genetic factors influence the distal outcome, say it's uh, health, independently of the environmental, the social environmental factors. The, the genetic factors are influencing the, the phenotype, usually as I said it's, it's a biological phenotype. On the top right hand corner we've got effect modification going on here, so the genetic factors which influence the, the biological phenotype or personality or psychological phenotype, uh, they modify the association between social factors and, and the, the distal Y or the, the health outcome. In the bottom left hand corner we've got uh, a process where uh, the, the genetic factors are actually causing the, the, the environmental response. So, so uh, a, a lot of the times people have looked at uh, the way how genetic factors are correlated with uh, educational attainment, for example, or intelligence. And so there, there's a whole process of, 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 by which genetic factors can influence the phenotypes which result in uh, low educational attainment, for example. And, and so, so there's been a whole series of studies that have uh, tried to disentangle the way in which biology is the independent variable and that affects uh, social environmental outcomes. And in the bottom right hand corner we've got an example where genetic factors uh, influence the, the phenotype which is actually uh, causing both the, the, the environmental factor to occur as well as the distal, uh, why the distal health outcomes. So the, the association between the social environment and the, and the distal why or the health outcome is confounded by the genetic factors. 
So in each of these uh, examples of biomarker research, we, we really need to be very careful in, in trying to find out what is the association between the social and biological data. And that really needs careful consideration within the relevant theoretical framework. Um, if we don't have that theoretical framework, we are in danger of making multiple comparisons uh, resulting in trying to find associations with the, uh, with the lowest p-values, which is basically unscientific and non-reproducible. And that's because with biosocial data, we have hundreds and maybe thousands of variables that are both relate to the biology of, of somebody as well as their, 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 their survey responses. And, and the temptation for, for a lot of researchers is just to do uh, a lot of correlations and, and do p-hacking, for example, which would be uh, nonsensical because we need to be do analyzing these, these associations within the context of a particular uh, theoretical, a particular biosocial theoretical framework. And finally, I'd just like to emphasize the need for inter interdisciplinary research teams, because this kind of biosocial research framework uh, does require expertise of, of both uh, bi in biological sciences as well as in so social sciences. And un unless somebody is trained in both, it is quite hard for, for one person to come up with a, a, a relevant theoretical framework, a relevant biosocial theoretical framework, which is why some of the best biosocial research does rely on sort of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary research teams.